keto freaks, this is Carl. Do you or someone you know have trouble focusing? You know what I'm talking about. You sit down to read something, try to figure out your monthly budget, write that novel you've been putting off, or maybe you just can't seem to do one task at a time. Well, you may not know this, but I'm a musician as well as a software developer. Programming is a job that requires focus, long periods of uninterrupted work. It's hard for them and for you. I've created music to code by. This is music, yes, but it's specifically and scientifically designed to promote focus. Studies show that when math students were exposed to Baroque music between 60 and 80 beats per minute, they did better with comprehension and testing. So I created more modern music that is neither boring nor distracting, but falls within that tempo range. It's just the right mix. I also made the pieces 25 minutes long. That correlates to research that shows we all get brain fatigue after 20 or so minutes of hard focus. The result is thousands of happy customers. Now, you don't have to be a programmer to reap the benefits of music to code by. It has been known to soothe restless pets, calm fussy babies, and even help autistic kids relax and fall asleep. Listen to some free samples at musictocodeby.net. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 72-ish pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet for over two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. And within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. Mm. I've also lost, well, in fact, I've lost 84 pounds as well, of this uh, week. And <laughs> I know, I've got an update. Last yeah. week, it was only 70 pounds. Yeah. So I've lost 84 pounds and I have completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through nutritional ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. We're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. We've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite the research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably figure out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. So every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. No, it cannot. <laughs> so let's start episode 38. The Cholesterol Hacking Show. Oh, yeah. Well, Richard, before we get started, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? I think we're pretty good because last week we did a rerun of the Ketone Show. So That's we should right. be okay. That's right. But now we're back. So let's recap what a ketogenic diet is. A ketogenic diet is any diet that puts you in a state of nutritional ketosis. Pretty much. Where your liver is burning body fat for fuel. Mm -hmm. And to get there, we want to limit carbohydrates to 20 grams per day. That's right. Of course, this is just what we follow. There are lots of variations. Yeah. As for protein, that scales with how much lean body mass you have. We use one to one and a half grams per kilogram of lean body mass. Yep. And as for fat, you eat that to satiety. Yeah. And what that means is if you're hungry, reach for some fat. Mm, fat's the fuel. Yeah. So, Carl, how was your week? My week was pretty good. Well, it's been two weeks, right? And uh, mm, yeah, because we we were I was in Las Vegas at a software development uh, conference called Dev Intersection last week. Sure. And while I was there, I ate ketogenic, and I did a I had a great time. I was yeah. 
fat awesome. fueled the entire time. In fact, as soon as I got there, I went to a, a supermarket and I got some brie and I got some ready-made Parmesan nice. crisps and and some apple cider vinegar and and some seltzer water. So I was just in hog heaven. Mm. I would not eat breakfast. And then as soon as I got hungry during the day, the first thing I did was reach for a piece of brie. Yeah. And when that ran out, um, there was a Starbucks there and my wife would go to the Starbucks and get a, a bagel with cream cheese and two pats of butter. Mm. She put one pat of butter on her bagel because she doesn't like cream cheese. Give me the cream cheese and the other butter. And that would be my nice. first meal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Check this out. There is a grand opening of Masuharo Morimoto's restaurant called Morimoto. Oh, yeah. In the yeah. MGM Grand where we were. Awesome. And and I went there twice. Mm. Shh. <laughs> twice. <laughs> That's luxury. Oh, my God. This First of all, the man is a – carbs or no carbs. The man is a genius with food. Yeah. He yeah. puts together food not only that's beautiful, but in combinations that you would not expect. Mm. And he just fundamentally knows what things go together, how things taste, what their flavor profiles are, and how to make interesting and delicious food. Yeah. So the last night I was there at Morimoto, I got some of his Wagyu beef. Oh, and yeah. this was Wagyu ribeye, mm -hmm. which comes in at $30 an ounce. Yeah. I had nine ounces. Nice. That's a two hundred and seventy dollar <laughs> Wagyu steak. <laughs> Don't ask me how it got paid for. Worth every cent, I'm sure. <laughs> well, you know, it it really was amazing, and I and yeah. it's the kind of thing you have to do once in your life. So, is this Kobe beef? Well, it it is from the same strain as Kobe beef, but it's Wagyu. Mm. So, Wagyu is is Kobe that's genetically similar or from that line. However, it is not official Kobe, which I believe you can only get in Japan and maybe a couple select places around the world. Yeah. I know that uh, somebody in the UK in our forum actually uh, told me that uh, all of the Wagyu that they get in, in England all comes from Australia. So mm. it's uh, we certainly, all the Wagyu that we get here, obviously, is locally grown. So, yeah. But Wagyu, I believe, just means Japanese cow. So it's a Japanese breed that we then treat the same way that, you know, the fancy Kobe beef is treated. You know, right. it's fed a lot of carbs and it's given massages and fed and beer. And, fed beer, yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah, the end result is life. the marbling is so deep that it, yeah. you can think of it as like the foie gras of beef. Right. You know, just because there's so much yeah. fat, or as I like to say, beef flavored fat. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not healthy for the cow, but uh, it's delicious. Probably not. <laughs> delicious. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say? I stayed, uh, I maintained my weight the whole time, and uh, I just mm. felt great the whole time, and it was wonderful. So that was my week, nice. however, my two weeks. How was yours? Yeah, mine was interesting because over the past two weeks, I've done a 10-day uh, fast. I joined the Zorn Fast. Yeah. And initially, it was just going to be three or four days. And then I hit the third day, and I'm thinking, I'm actually feeling good here. I'm going to keep going. Mm. And then I sort of hit day five, and I thought, yep, yeah, I'm still going really well. And then I hit day seven, which was my previous best, and I was still flying along nicely. So I kept going, and then on the, on the 10th day, uh, I lost a lot of weight and I thought that's not right because we know how much fat mass I could or how much energy I can get from fat. We know how much that's going to weigh. Yeah. Um, and I, I lost a lot more than that. And there's a lot, there's a lot of fat free mass. It's not all, it's not all protein that, that I would have lost, but there's a lot of fat free mass involved. But uh, I got to the point where I just decided, no, that's enough. 10 days is good enough. And, uh, the uh, tail of the tape for the end of the 10 days was that I lost 8.4 kilograms, wow. which is 18.48 pounds yeah. uh, in that time. And I went from uh, a body fat percentage of uh, around about 25 to about 21. So, you know, that was significant. I don't like to lose a lot quickly. I like to uh, have a bit of a, a, a plateau where my body gets an opportunity to recover and mm. to uh, be comfortable with the weight it was at. Mm. And the interesting thing was that uh, I, today I did a bike ride. I'd normally do a 50K bike ride on a Sunday. And uh, some sometimes when I'm fasting, like last week I was you know three or four days into the fast and I did 100K. Mm. Uh, but this week I did a 50K. 
Last week, I had a lot more fat. I mm. had a lot more energy available to me, and I rode that 100K without any problems at all. The weird thing was that uh, today when I did a 50K, probably about 40 kilometres into it, I just I, I was like dragging the chain. I was just wow. I, I just lost energy. And so I'm thinking I'm getting to the point where I really can't generate a lot of power, a lot of energy from my body fat. And so... My goal is to try and get under 100, uh, under 100 kilograms and feel what that's like for maybe six months or so. Well, but it shouldn't be a surprise to you because you actually worked out the math. Yeah. Do the numbers fit your um, formulas about, you know, how much body fat, how, much, how many calories you can draw from your body fat? Does it fit? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, when I started this, this uh, fast 10 days ago, I was able to draw about uh, 2,000 and 79 kilocalories per day from my body fat. By the time I'd finished, it was more like 1,400 kilocalories per wow. day. So the amount of options that I have for doing things like fasting or fasted exercise, all of these things are going to require calories, and there's a limit to how many that you can pull out of your body fat. And so mm. really if I want to fast, if I, if I lose weight from here, um, I really have to supplement my but my energy from body fat with dietary fat to be able yeah. to fast properly. So, right. but, but it just means that I need to work out how many calories that I'm expecting to use during the day, how mm. many my body fat can deliver, and then supplement the remainder in in form of uh, a pure fat. Butter, butter, eat <laughs> some butter, oil. something yeah. like that. So, so that that's uh, ironically to fast. You, uh, if you don't have the body fat to fast, you need to supplement with uh, some form of uh, dietary fat. Wow, and uh, bravo for you, Richard. That's fantastic. What oh, a thanks. great story. Yes. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy. The other interesting thing about all of this is that the point that my I started this, I was 140 kilograms. I'm currently 101 kilograms, and at the beginning of the fast, I was 110 kilograms. Mm. So I'd lost 30 kilograms, and my body had sort of sat at that point between, uh, I guess you know, 108 to 110 range for almost uh, two years now. Hmm. The interesting thing was that that range that my body plateaued at was the point where I had enough body fat to generate a day's worth of energy yeah. without any problem. So my body knew the ideal body fat rate, and it's not it's not a BMI of 20. For me, a BMI of around about 27 um, is, uh, uh, um, is probably going to be ideal for me, yeah. Fantastic. Hey, uh, while I was in Vegas, we appeared mm -hmm. on Jimmy Moore's show, Low Carb Conversations. And yeah. shout out to Jimmy. Thank you for having us on the show. We had a great time and it was a good episode. Thanks for being a gracious host. Yeah. Yep. We'll uh, provide a link to that. Well, that's enough chit chat. Let's get to Mel! 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 I've got my mail hat on. <laughs> yeah. We have quite a bit of mail. Uh, you want mm. me to start or you want to start? Go for it. Go for All it. right, I'll start. This one comes from Chris with a K, mm -hmm. K-R-I-S. Mm -hmm. Had my first annual physical since going keto on June 1st. Mm. Awesome appointment. Keto doctor who's been doing keto for more than four years. Wow. We sat, shared stories and information, and here are my ratios. Mm. Total cholesterol HDL ratio is 3.38. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's break that down. What does that ratio actually mean? Well, I don't think it's a meaningful marker of anything. I think the most important in marker here is that her triglycerides over HTL is uh, zero point seven six, which is yeah. spot in the ideal range. And also, her HDL over LDL ratio is point four four eight. Mm. Also, really great. Yeah. So she says. Also, I was. Uh, 5.8 for A1C before, and that has decreased to a 5.4. Nice. I'm in a stall right now, but my body is still recovering from the hospital stay, dehydration, cortisol spikes, so I'm not going to sweat it. Rather, I'll just keep calm and keto on. Well done, Chris. Yeah. I think that the body stalls when it gets to a point where it needs to regather itself and basically get into a comfortable state. And mm. if you've had an operation, um, you're... Certainly, your body is going to be producing cortisol to deal with the the inflammation that's happening, right. and you're going to be making a lot of sugar. You're going to you really need to, uh, as you say. I mean, it's an excellent strategy is to uh, accept it 
Accept the fact that things are going to be moving around a little bit. Keep calm and keto on and your body will get to a stasis where it's very comfortable and then you can uh, continue losing. Very true. Yeah, and it's also great to have a keto doctor. That's very rare. You're very lucky. Yeah, very lucky. Mm. So we've got one from Marty who says, I've been doing the keto way of life since January, kind of like Carl. Yeah. And uh, I'm an endurance racer, an Ironman marathon and ultra marathons. Wow. Uh, Saturday, I did my longest race this year, which is a 50K. Uh, it's about 31 miles mm -hmm. with maybe 800 calories and extra carbs. Yeah. Finished second place overall and the oldest female finisher. Fueling with fat works. Yeah. Sure does. Yeah. Uh, anyone got any ideas of any fat snacks or high fat snacks that I could try while racing? Butter. Butter. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very practical though, is it? <laughs> well, you could have butter in a in a baggie and just squeeze That's... it in. Yeah, you know, chew, <laughs> chew the end off the baggie and squeeze That'd it in your mouth. Great. I usually ride with a baggie of salted macadamias in case I get an energy slump, and I didn't have them today, and I kind of wish I had because I reckon if I'd just had a few macadamias, I would have kept going. Yeah, the longer that you go with the adaptation, the more efficient you become. And uh, Dr. Volek was able to show that some of his athletic test subjects took almost six months to get back to their PBs. So well, that's their personal best times. Mm. So I reckon uh, that I personally need less external fuel now 30 months into keto than I did at 12 months. But then this weekend... I, maybe I just lost too much weight too quickly, um, yeah. and that's probably another good reason why it was good to uh, to pause. Well, we had a lot more mail in the last two weeks, but we're not going to read it all for the sake of time. We really mm. want to bring on our guest today, don't we, Richard? Yeah, definitely. So we want to introduce Dave Feldman today. Now, he's Dave. Dave's been in our Facebook group since the beginning. I think he was maybe what, the first 10 or so uh, people to join the Facebook group. That's right. So, uh, I, so Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, guys. You're welcome. And uh, Dave, let me just uh, read your bio here. Uh, Dave's a software engineer, a senior software engineer like Richard and I, mm. and a business developer who began a low-carb, high-fat diet in April 2015 and has since learned everything he could about it with special emphasis on cholesterol, giving his lipid numbers spiked substantially after going on the diet. And uh, you can tweet him at Dave Keto. So Dave, you're a software engineer like Richard and I, and we have noticed that it, it's the engineers that are sort of doing the hacking of metabolism and looking into the science just because, that. It, it, well, not all of, you know, we're not the only ones, but we have that special focus on why and answering the why question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, I would I would take it a step further, Carl. I would say that we tend to approach this on a more of a systems level um, right. thought process. Like I, for the people out there who are engineers, um, this one's just for you. I feel like medicine puts too much emphasis on unit testing and not <laughs> mm. functional testing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, you know much. I'm talking to other software engineers because they get that right away. But basically yeah. the, the bottom line is, they like to get things in a lab. They like to prove the chemical reactions that are actually happening at a molecular level, and they 100% get that right. And I'm, I will, I will tell you some of the things that I found that they've learned really is uh, amazing. It's very jaw dropping. Mm. The thing that I found since starting this that really does amaze me, unfortunately, in the negative sense is I really don't feel like there's a good 50,000 foot view perspective right. of why these processes exist from an engineering standpoint and why they would make sense. For, for example, um, one of my frustrations is I'll read that they'll, they'll talk about cholesterol almost as if it's the, um, the trash wrapper that uh, packaged your food that was going into your bloodstream and now it's just uh, got to get it's, they have to get rid of it that the body's right. made a mistake by ever having it in the bloodstream in the first place right since all of our cells can synthesize it well us as engineers we're thinking well no if i reverse engineering another engineer's work and all of this other all of these other parts of the process seem to be genius why would i just assume that this one part was a complete mistake this is exactly what I told my doctor when she was freaked out over my high cholesterol. Like you, mine spiked after losing 35 pounds in just two and a half months. And I went and she said, but your cholesterol is through the roof, right? And, and I said, look, why would the body be so stupid to reduce all of the, you know, change all of the markers that we know are, are bad and reduce them and bring them down, basically a better 
better profile, but except for this one thing, why, why, right. why would that happen? You know? And she looked at me and said, you're, you're absolutely right. There's gotta be something we don't understand. And that's where you're taking the words right out of my mouth because when I got my first cholesterol test, it was after being seven and a half months of keto and feeling better than any other time in my entire life, right. including my childhood. Yeah. I've never felt better than I have on keto. And I, and I don't want to say it's all peaches and sunshine. I still get sick from time to time. I still have some issues. Yeah. But some things that I just kind of figured were just part of my life were like GI uh, issues and um, even getting sick to the same frequency. I don't get sick as much and so forth. All of these things to me suggest that, no, I've now reached a new level of balance. And so I'm going to be a little more skeptical as to some markers that they consider to be bad markers, whatever they may be. And I, I'm going to research for myself what it is that those markers mean. Of course, the biggest one was uh, cholesterol, which it is for many other people on a ketogenic diet. And I really feel like this is where we kind of have to like drive to a point that all of us have to face, which is it's the biggest question out there for a ketogenic diet. The biggest fear. It is. I think this is the last frontier uh, to convince people that this is a safe and effective diet. And, and we're just stuck in this, uh, in this mindset because none of us have known any different all our lives. But as you know, and for thousands of years, maybe a couple hundred thousand years, there were no carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are actually the fad diet. <laughs> Correct. We've had, we've had enormous amounts of practice. I like to put it this way. From an ancestral standpoint, We've had enormous amounts of practice for the vast, vast majority of humankind's existence with lots of protein and lots of fat. Yep. Our bodies worked and re-engineered and re-engineered and re-engineered based on those two macronutrients to a very large extent. And then all of a sudden, we shifted the pie chart to add enormous amounts of carbs. Mm, yeah. we, don't, we don't have a lot of practice in that. And sure enough, we have all of these metabolic diseases that we associate with civilization that without question from an engineering standpoint, <laughs> if you were bringing me code that kept uh, uh, breaking in ways that it wasn't breaking before, I would say, well, what's going on with the inputs? Yeah. Yeah. What have you changed? Right. Well, I almost would like it if everybody could just erase everything that they know for just a moment. We're going to take you back to how it is you fuel your body on fats because nice. I think think a lot of people out there think, I'm going to eat some food, and based on a few things I've read, they're going to get converted to ketones, and now I'm in ketosis, and now I'm burning <laughs> ketones, right? Right. And in reality, no, you're actually, you're fueling the vast majority, the, the vast majority of fuel that you are using are long-chain fatty acids. Fatty acids, right. Yep. And for sure, you're using ketones as well, but Actually, the vast majority of those fatty acids are absorbed long before uh, they hit the liver. Now, I, I absolutely welcome lipidologists to correct me later, but here's what I'm going to describe. You eat the food. It goes through, uh, it gets into your gut, into your small intestine, mm -hmm. through your enterocytes, the fatty acids, long chain fatty acids go. The, the vast majority of other sources of energy are going to be handled by the liver because mm -hmm. the liver is a control freak that says, ah, I got to deal with uh, sucrose. I got to pull that apart. I got to work with it, right? Ah, I've mm. got to actually do something with uh, fructose. I got to do something with that maker's mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I need to, I need to handle this alcohol. I need to detoxify it. And, yeah. and so many of these processes ultimately go through the liver, but you know what? Long chain fatty acids that came from the triglycerides that were in the food you just ate, they have what we call in engineering a trail of trust. They can go straight through the enterocytes, ultimately make their way into the lymphatic system, and then ultimately make their way into the bloodstream to be packaged up into, everybody say it with me, low density lipoproteins. Yeah. <laughs> low density lipoproteins are actually a very convenient container for most of the hydrophobic elements that your body wants in your bloodstream. So hydrophobic are the ones that don't mix with water, such as all of your fat-soluble vitamins, cholesterol, and fat. Correct. And from an engineering standpoint, this is genius. It is. Mm. We would do the same thing. If we were engineering something, we said, okay, well, we have this kind of highway, if you will, that's within the system. 
but this highway has special rules for certain things they can travel on and certain things they can't, we would say, well, the things they can't travel on it but need to should go into this one vehicle that has multiple uses. It's just like turning an object into text so it can be transmitted over the internet to and from a server, let's say. So it's like a serializer. Exactly. It's like turning a fat object into JSON so that it can go <laughs> across the wire. You see how you yeah. said this up there, Richard? <laughs> I see it. Yeah, I saw it. Because <laughs> Richard and I were talking about this last night, um, I, yeah. and Richard gave me permission to go extra geeky, so here we Absolutely. go. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, those those lipoproteins, and we don't really normally get to discuss it, so those lipoproteins have a snaky protein uh, that's the protein part of it called apolipoproteins on them. Yep. And the um, low density lipoproteins are known for having the ApoB, but they also mm -hmm. have other apolipoproteins on it. Well, those apolipoproteins are, to use another engineering term, they are like headers, the same ones you get in your email. So even mm -hmm. those people who aren't engineers, they often see the uh, accidentally will see the headers, which are all the additional texts that have to do uh, with networking, being able to curry it to the correct places. It's meta information. Yeah, it's metadata. It's it's like where the message came from, where it's going to, all of the servers that are passed on the way, how long it is, what type of data it is inside yeah. it. All this stuff is metadata that tells you. It doesn't tell you the content of the letter. It tells you what its lifespan was. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a mailing label, if you will. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Mm. And we want to have mailing labels on those lipoproteins that effectively can tell cells which ones it can bind to. And the cells have LDL receptors. In fact, there's a huge family of LDL receptors that yeah. fit nicely to certain apolipoproteins. Why? So that those jobs can still be spread out between two different subject points, the low-density lipoprotein and the cells, but can still have lots of different jobs based on which LDL receptors are expressed. Aha. Uh -huh. Flexibility. There's one thing that really um, hits me hard anytime I'm talking to somebody about this whole diet heart hypothesis, which is when you eat uh, saturated fat, it, it clogs your arteries and all that nonsense. And the reason is, is that this is sort of what happens with sugar. When you eat sugar, it's water soluble and it goes right into your bloodstream and wreaks all this havoc with diabetes and high blood sugar and all that stuff because it's water soluble. But so people made the jump and thought, well, if it happens with sugar, it also happens with fat. The fat will go directly into your bloodstream as fat and then start clogging stuff up. But not understanding that, no, it, it doesn't. It, it has to be broken down into fatty acids and lipoproteins and things that are well water soluble, right? Yes. Well, actually I would I would kind of qualify that a little bit. The to do this, we kind of have to take a step back and talk about the scene of the crime. The scene of the crime for the clogging that we're talking about is the vessel walls and they are lined with a special cell called endothelial cells. Mm. And one of the things that struck me from as early as I started researching is that everything came back to the endothelial cells and in particular with damage to the endothelial cells. Now, if I talk to your average person who's in the ketogenic community and I say, are you familiar with the diet heart hypothesis? They'll say, well, yeah, Ansel Keys, all the history of the last 60 years, etc." If I say, are you familiar with the chronic endothelial injury hypothesis? I'll bet you guys aren't familiar with this, right? Oh, I'm familiar with it. <laughs> and most people don't know what you're talking about by name, but I mean, it's a very widely held hypothesis. Right. And let me, and let me unpack that a little bit. The reason it can be widely known within the communities that are familiar with it is because it's actually in use all the time. They actually induce atherosclerosis through a balloon catheter yeah. in lab animals. And they can do this, and they typically do it to the carotid artery. They do this by injecting it and expanding it and contracting it several times. Debridement. Well, yes, damaging those endothelial cells, which often can uh, induce atherosclerosis. So short version is we absolutely know a cause for atherosclerosis being endothelial damage. That is proven day in and day out, right? But as of yet... 
and I would love to be corrected on this, anybody feel free to send me a study. Send me a study that shows that LDL particle concentration is an independent source of atherosclerosis while controlling for endothelial damage. Yeah, that doesn't exist. I tell you what does cause endothelial damage, and that's insulin. Yes, exactly. And 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 free radicals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We know with insulin, there was a study done in the 60s where dogs were made chemically diabetic, and then they were given insulin in the arteries of just one leg, and they were able to make dogs with one leg that has cardiovascular disease. And there was a, another study where rabbits rabbits are really easy to make uh, have atherosclerosis. You just feed them cholesterol and, and they, they become atherosclerotic. And this was part of the hypothesis that caused us to think that eating cholesterol made us uh, athero- made, uh, made humans atherosclerotic. For omnivores, yeah, but it only yeah. applies to herbivores. Yeah, but if you feed rabbits uh, cholesterol, they become atherosclerotic. But if you knock out their insulin with the same chemical, I think it's called allotoxin, if you knock their ability to make insulin out with the exact same chemical, they no longer become atherosclerotic when you feed them cholesterol. So hmm. insulin not only does the damage, without the insulin, it's not possible to cause the damage. So... Those two studies are probably a fairly good indication that insulin is the major culprit. Well, and that's that's part of my issue. My issue is that I keep wanting to find ways to disassociate the endothelial damage. One of the most common arguments for it being high levels of LDL cholesterol comes back to familiar hypercholesterolemia. Right. Yeah. And that literally means familiar being uh, on the genetic side, hyper being high and emia being in the blood. So high mm. cholesterol in the blood is an actual literal breakdown of the disease. But the irony is that's, mm. that's not necessarily what the nature of the genetic dysfunction is. The genetic dysfunction is actually in the LDL receptors themselves. They have a difficult time binding to those apolipoproteins I spoke of earlier. Yeah. It's, and so then the question becomes to me, okay, is this a clearance problem, which is what they speculate that it is? It's not clearing mm-hmm. the uh, LDL that's in the blood or, or as I would argue now, especially with how my data has been shaping up, is it in fact an upregulation of the liver knowing that these endothelial cells will be malnourished? Upregulation means creating more. Creating more, yes. So, for example, let's say that you had... Um, Let's say that you had your child on the other side of a fence, and your child's not a very good catcher, but he needs to catch his sandwich to eat, and he won't pick it up. He won't pick it up off the uh, ground, right? So you throw him a sandwich, and he misses it. He's going, ah, you really need to eat, Timmy. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and throw you another sandwich because I got a I got a whole bucket full of these, right? Again, from an engineering standpoint. I'm going to go ahead and spam you with sandwiches because I care more <laughs> about you eating than I care about these sandwiches. Right. Now, I myself will not claim that I'm certain that cholesterol in high concentrations isn't in fact atherogenic. Mm-hmm. It very well right. could be. To be a good scientist, I can't make a claim that I don't really have full information on. Mm-hmm. It, there's, there's a difference between feeling like a theory is falsified and just feeling like the case for it is weak. Right. Hmm. And and I feel the latter. I feel that the case is surprisingly weak. When I got my first cholesterol numbers on a scale of 1 to 10, I was a 9 of concern. Now I'm more like a 5.5. But I'm not a 0. <laughs> yeah. In that context, part of what's had me rethinking everything is my own data, is the fact that the results are so manipulatable, if you will. So, Dave, tell me about your data. Okay. It's hard for me to kind of put in a brief version, but I think I'll just go ahead and use the most recent event because obviously it's gotten a lot of talk recently. Yeah, yeah, sure has. The very first public presentation of data that I did was at the Keto Gain Seminar on October 9th. And knowing mm-hmm. that October 9th was coming, I said, eh, it's time to take it to the next level and actually prove predictability. Right. So I wrapped my most recent experiment completely around that conference. I intentionally ate around 750 calories a day for for five days coming up to the Friday 
just before the conference began. And it's also important to say that it was 750 calories, but it was ketogenic. Yes. Whenever I say calories, I mean it on a ketogenic ratio. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, we like to say, and I think it's generally true, that you just don't need to worry about calories. But sure. you do in the sense that you need to understand total energy load. Yeah. So on a ketogenic ratio, I stayed uh, at around 750 calories right up until that Friday morning. I took a blood test and I told everyone then, and I put in my presentation slide later, that that blood test on Friday morning would show that my cholesterol was extraordinarily high. I then ramped up to 5,000 calories a day wow. for a total of five days, but I knew that the three-day mark was going to be on the Monday morning of uh, uh, the day after I did the presentation. And I put in my slide, massive cholesterol drop in progress. Yeah. And I staked my reputation and everything on the fact that right now this was going to be one of the largest shifts I've ever seen. Yeah. That's amazing. And 5,000 calories ketogenic means, well, your carbs are nothing. Your protein is still the same. So you're really talking about adding enough um, fat to get you to 5,000 calories. Yes. Well, and I did keep it proportional. So technically I had more carbs than when I had, say, uh, the 750 calories. Part of the reason for doing that is I didn't want that to be an additional confounder or another discussion point. Oh, okay. I wanted to prove that same ratio, higher caloric load specifically leads to lower cholesterol test score. And sure enough, I broke all my own records. Uh, wow. This was the largest drop that I I, I mean, I, I was I was impressed that it had such an impact on LDLP as well. But yeah, my cholesterol dropped, uh, my LDL dropped 73 points in three days. Wow. Wow. And my LDLP dropped uh, 1,115 points in three days. Now, were you paying for an assay every day? Uh, not every day. I paid for it on Friday and I paid for it on the following Monday. So how do you know your cholesterol dropped it over three days that much? Because it was three days in between Friday and Monday. Oh, I thought you meant, I thought you were talking about the whole 10 days. No, no, no. Uh, so the whole 10 days, to, to kind of back it up a step, the reason I mentioned 10 days is because the next part, part two of what I'm going to have up on the blog, will actually detail four tests total. I mainly been talking about the two tests that were wrapped around the Keto Gains Conference. I got it. The first three days of your five-day fat spree. Yes. Of, of the period of time that I knew the highest shift would occur. I see. But in truth, I've actually done a total of four tests, two that preceded the conference, and both those tests were on a lower caloric intake while still being ketogenic, and two that succeeded that were after the conference on the Monday and then the following Wednesday. The reason I did that is because I already knew that LDLP goes on a longer day um, equation, if you will, in that it does a three-day window with a two-day gap. So I speculate that right now, if I were to take my blood test, and it's a Sunday, uh, I would not expect that Saturday, Friday, and Thursday would count for LDLP, but it would count for LDLC. Mm -hmm. For LDLP, it would be... Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Sorry, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So, Dave, what you're saying is that for five days you ate 750 kilocalories of a ketogenic ratio, did a blood test, and then for another five days you ate uh, 5,000 uh, kilocalories a day at the same ketogenic ratio, did a second blood test, and you were able to show that all of the good lipids went up and all of the bad lipids went down. That's what the test result, as they would interpret it, shows. The reason I coax it in that language is because I don't actually feel like that's the true zero-sum game, which yep. we'll yeah. kind of get into in a moment. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're all on the same page there. So all of this data, you've been doing this since, I think, you were, in January you, were, you started this, where you were getting NMR tests almost uh, several a week, and you, you went to the, the conference. Was it the conference in Vail? Yes. Uh, that you're at, and you you had already been doing it for maybe a month or so then. So you've been, to generate this hypothesis, you've been having an insane amount of blood tests. 
Yes, actually about 40, I think, up to this point. 40 wow. since wow. November of last year. Wow. So I've done, I've done probably, I want to say, um, four or five tests where it was successive blood tests either every day or every few days in order to tease out a particular data point. And before we get into your hypothesis, I got to ask the question, do the changes in your lipids persist or, you know, in other words, is your cholesterol stayed low, your LDL, or has it slowly creeped back up to homeostasis? The creeping up and creeping down suggests that it's not associated with just the short-term food intake. Right. And I do believe that there is a combination of effectively two numbers here in order to have such a discrete inverse pattern show up. Yeah. The first number is what I would call the baseline. And the baseline is, we'll say, the floor. So let's say for me, and I'm just going to make a number up, let's say it's um, 150. Let's say my LDL, even if I was eating 5,000, even if I was eating 10,000 calories, my LDL just would not go below 150. Okay. I don't mean to test this part, <laughs> yeah. but let's just say that that's the floor. The other number, the number above the floor is the one that keeps moving up and down inversely. So I'm curious about why it is that floor is so static, but if it weren't yeah. so static, I wouldn't get such a discrete pattern on the inversion, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I suspect is that that baseline will be impacted by exercise. Because yeah. it is, in fact, the LDL particles are, in fact, fuel, or at least they're containing the fuel that my body's making use of the most, the long chain fatty acids. That's why I'm going to keep always bringing this back to energy. Cholesterol follows energy. So what exactly do you mean by that? So let me actually unpack it a little bit more with an analogy, and this will get a little less geeky, but it's kind of important. Let's say that we're going to pretend all the lipoproteins are boats because they're often, it's the term that's often used for lipoproteins. It's a great metaphor, yeah. It really is. And the problem, the problem is there's such a white hot spotlight on cholesterol that we don't realize that cholesterol is kind of like the life rafts on the boats. Life rafts in use are definitely a cause of concern. If you see life rafts in the water, you would say, yeah. well, there's, there's probably a problem going on there. Mm. But life rafts on boats, not in use, aren't a problem, but yeah. they are a good thing to have on your boat, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Now, if you were only focusing on life rafts, whether they were in the water or whether they were on boats, you would see a big cause of concern if you saw a lot of boats. You'd say, ah, there's a major problem in play because I see a lot of life rafts. There must be an issue. But it's just as silly as what I'm describing because... Boat's purposes are not to carry around life rafts. A boat's right. purpose is to carry around people and cargo. Yeah. And so all of this focus that we're putting on cholesterol ends up getting thrown off by my data once we realize it's really just the exchange between chylomicrons and VLDLs. Mm. Chylomicrons are the lipoproteins that are made from food we just ate. And yep. they expire really quickly. They expire in a matter of hours. Whereas VLDLs are the other major class, if you will, of LDL particles, and they generally come from the gut. They come from the liver and they come from storage. And so when my body is observing a lower amount of energy coming in from what I'm eating, it's, it's seeing that there's less chylomicrons. It then upregulates total VLDL lipoproteins. That makes sense because yeah, you need to carry energy from your stored energy reserves to your tissue that needs energy. Yes. And in this case, as a scientist, I actually like that the cholesterol that I see in my blood, those life rafts that are on the boats, I know that those boats are VLDLs. I know that they're not chylomicrons because chylomicrons have already become remnants. They've already become clear. And now there's primarily VLDLs left, and that's why it works so inversely with the amount of food that I'm eating. I knew that eating 5,000 calories a day would flood my body with energy. That energy would be contained in those chylomicron LDL particles. 
So as it kept seeing it, it said, well, we're in a state of food abundance. We do not need to upregulate that other major classification of LDL particles, the VLDLs. Yeah, and, so they go down. Right. And those VLDLs, specifically the cholesterol on those VLDLs, is what's getting measured in the corresponding blood test the next day. Hmm, sure. So this is interesting as a response to uh, what I saw Stephen Finney talking about, where his his hypothesis about why LDL goes up in some people on a ketogenic diet was that this was um, triglycerides and cholesterol being removed from fat cells into the bloodstream and then being flushed out by the liver uh, as as uh, you know we we as we eat more fat and less carbohydrate. So it's interesting that this is just a, a different take on, you know, that was an interesting attempt at explaining it, but how spot on was he? My honest to goodness guess right now is that I, I believe because you're speaking to lipolysis where we're actually pulling um, those stored triglycerides out of the uh, adipose tissue. Mm. And it's it's a question I'm very curious about myself. I right now have lost all of my non-functional weight for the most part. I'm a very lean individual. Right. And therefore, in a sense, it could turn out that I'm able to exhibit these discrete patterns in my bloodstream more because there's not as much lipolysis going on with me. Yeah. And therefore, the short-term storage coming back and forth is something that's going to show up in a more discreet manner where somebody else who's, for example, losing weight and experiencing these ups and downs might have lipolysis as a confounding variable, if that makes sense. So what does this mean for the statin industry, my friend? Well, that's actually a good question. I, I don't want to say that I believe that statins are completely useless in any sense in that it very well could be that if you're young, you're male, you're a smoker, and you've had a prior cardiac event, that it actually may help you on your all-cause mortality. But I will say this, understanding the nature of them and how they ultimately poison the pathway with uh, HMG co-reductase and yeah. literally obstruct the nature in which your lipid system is working I find I, I really think it'd be one of the very last things that I would take under almost any circumstance. I think mm. a statin executive would have to have a, a bus full of small children that it said it was going to push off a cliff. And then I then I would probably consider very strongly taking a statin. Mm -hmm. So I guess the next question is, if you're able to modify your uh, cholesterol numbers at will with five days notice by modifying what you eat, what does that mean for the insurance industry that uses these as a guideline to setting insurance premiums? Well, I'm actually glad you brought this up. Obviously, I only have my own data to go off of, but a lot of people have asked me advice on this particular account. And I have actually had a few people that have reached out and said this worked for them, but it's still anecdotal and I don't want to hang my hat on it until we've actually had a study that really formalizes this. However, let's just say that you are on a ketogenic diet and all you care about is manipulating those cholesterol numbers and you believe your data will be consistent with mine, in which case I would say you should get as close to my 5,000 calorie uh, day experiment as you can <laughs> and eat as much fat as possible so that you're flooding your body with chylomicrons and therefore it does not upregulate the VLDLs that would show up in your um, fasting uh, cholesterol test of the next day. With a caveat that you don't have a lot of body fat and maybe another test should be done with somebody that does have body fat to see if they get the same result. Absolutely. And I do want to add one other step, which is I always do a 14 hour fast in between the last meal I had from the evening before and the blood test that I have on the following morning. And that's important. That's very important because if you don't do that fast, this whole equation falls apart because then you can actually have chylomicrons or chylomicron remnants that might actually get picked up by the cholesterol blood test. So how much does it cost to do one of these tests to do a lipid panel? I got a lot of my tests through a website called requestatest.com where you can order it privately. Is, what is it called? Request a test? 
requestedtest.com. Okay. And yeah, the test I'm referring to is the NMR, of course, nuclear magnetic resonance. You then go to one of their facilities like a lab core or something and um, provide the paperwork. And at that point, you can actually just get whatever test you ordered. And I was able to get it for $99. Yeah, so I I I would suggest go request that spend your ninety nine dollars after having tested this for yourself. Just this, just get the data for yourself to see if your data follows Dave's. See if your your blood tests uh, go the same way as Dave's do. And then once you know that it works, then then try it on your uh, your insurer. I'm definitely going to do it. And please share share the information whether whether it backs up the theory or it doesn't. Um, my one request is I know nobody's going to be just like me, but try to be just like me for five days and actually record carefully everything you ate mm. so that everything can get parsed out. I am genuinely curious about people who are losing weight, how much it might impact it. I'm curious mm. about what particular foods may or may not also impact it and so forth. But given how tight my correlations are, I definitely feel that the lipid system has been very effectively proven for me in particular to be the most impacted by just what I had been eating the days before I took the blood test. And if there's any point I want to drive home is for all the theories that we're talking about now of different levels of um, evidence, the evidence that I've showed that I'd hang my predictions on being that the lipid system is that agile is one that I feel so certain about that I feel like nobody should be making true life-changing decisions especially for things like a statin on a single annual blood test that shows their cholesterol oh, yeah. without at mm. least knowing that much, without at least comparing how much you ate before. Because I've talked to many different people who've said, you know, in anticipation of this cholesterol test I was getting, I started eating less because I wanted it to not be as high of a cholesterol score. And if my data is correct, that may in fact be artificially increasing your cholesterol score. Mm. And then, of yeah. course, making you feel even worse about it. Dave, you're a developer. Maybe you could create a website where people could go and plug in their data and then you could uh, apply a little machine learning to it. You know, it's actually funny you say this. There's a guy I talked to yesterday and he's advertised before on Jimmy Moore and I've also met him at uh, one of the conferences. And that's actually the business model he's chasing after with his partners to put together a lot of information. And, and right now it's very centric towards uh, the ketogenic lifestyle. And I said, if you can really get this up and going, I would definitely like to push it for this very reason that I would like for a lot of ketoers to go ahead and plug in their data and opt in to aggregate anonymous sharing so that yeah. we can actually get more. Because it's not even just on lipids and cholesterol. I would actually like to, for example, see a good example would be chloride. Chloride, uh, mine is a little bit below range, but I found out recently that that's actually pretty common for people who are ketogenic because we tend to be more acolyte uh, mm. based as opposed to acidic. And if so, that would be something that a lot of us would like to know and not have to hear from a conference somewhere. Yeah, very good. Well, this is awesome. Um, and Thanks for being a, you know, a guinea pig on yourself. It's guys like you who are helping all of us figure out what the heck is going on. And, and mark my words, I'm going to do this experiment because I'm in a great place right now to do this experiment. I've had pretty much uh, a bed at a plateau for a while and I had plenty of body fat. So it's another, another type, right? It's another body type or another state to test this hypothesis in. And I can't wait to see what happens. I would absolutely adore the data that could come out from it. And I would I would love to talk to you offline on how I'd like to construct the experiment with you just so that it could be um, captured very well for posterity, if that's possible. Let's do it. So we're going to include uh, links to Dave's blog uh, in our show notes, and that's got details about his experiments and specifically this predictive experiment that he did. And also, uh, at some point, hopefully, uh, he will have information on how to do this test yourself, how to collect the data in such a way that, that he can reuse it. Um, so uh, keep an eye on his website. Uh, but yeah. for now, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Dave for spending his time with us and giving us such a good, detailed, in-depth look at what he's done. 
Yes, Dave, thank you very much for spending the time with us. And once again, guys, thanks for having me on. You guys have been such a welcome addition to the ketogenic community because I often visit so many people that are on the dry science side and I love them all. They, they bring lots of information. I feel like <laughs> you guys bring a nice mix of science and friendliness and just overall good spirit, which is why I'm not surprised, Carl, that you would come up with the idea you had for the festival. I hope, I hope to see everybody there next year. Absolutely. Ketofest.com. Check it out. We're going to have fun. Thanks again, Dave. Thank you. Well, Richard, that brings us to a couple of recipes. Recipes. <laughs> recipes. recipes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go first, I think. Do it. As you know, I did a 10-day fast. And at the end of a fast, you want to have a little bit of food uh, just to settle your belly, to get blood rushing to your stomach, to your gut. And then the first meal after that, I like to have something that's fermented because it's uh. going to help me start my my gut bacteria off with a good start. Good idea. So what I did this time was uh, we make our own kimchi and uh, we have recipes for kimchi that, uh, that work really well. Uh, but this recipe is going to use some of that kimchi, but you can buy kimchi in a can. It's sure. exactly the same. It's spicy so pickled what, cabbage, Korean. That's exactly what it is, Korean spicy pickled cabbage. And so what, what I do is I peel a tomato and there's a trick for peeling a tomato. You you get a knife and you slice uh, a little cross in the top of the tomato and you put it in boiling water for about two minutes. And what happens is the skin of the tomato starts to peel off. You pull it out of the boiling water. You don't want to cook the tomato in no. there. You're just trying to soften the skin. And then you use a knife to remove that uh, skin. And another thing that you can do is put it right in a bowl of cold water so you can actually oh, yeah. hold it in your hand while the skin <laughs> goes off and stop the cooking process. Yeah, one of the advantages of uh, diabetes is you lose a lot of sense of touch in your fingers. <laughs> so, you know, I, I lost I, mine years ago from playing guitar, man. Yeah, that uh, that and doing blood tests on your fingers. So right. anyway, so I so I peel the tomato now. I, we did some smoking the other day and we smoked a ham and we smoked some uh, la uh, some lamb shoulders and I did a whole tray full of peeled tomatoes smoked. Ugh. You don't have to smoke the tomatoes, but they're delicious. Oh, my gosh. That, that flavor, hickory flavor gets in there. So I've got these dried out little tomatoes that uh, – that are good to go. So what I do is I toss one of these in a magic bullet blender and I toss in about an equal amount of chicken stock. And on top of that, I put an equal amount of kimchi. And mo mostly I'm going to use a lot of juice of that kimchi, uh, a little bit of the kimchi uh, cabbage itself, but mainly the juice because I'm trying to get the flavor it going. And I whiz this up in the uh, the magic bullet, basically uh, blitz it de till, until there's no solid pieces of kimchi left anymore. And then uh, I put that in the microwave, warm it up. It takes about a minute in the microwave. And then add a little bit of cream, maybe about 30 mils of cream, put the lid on straight back into the magic bullet, whisk it up again and pour it out. And that's my kimchi soup. And that was really the meal that started my gut off after a 10-day fast. And I feel so good. Uh, hmm. having that sitting on my belly. Often after a fast, you'll have food and you'll feel like you just swallowed a brick. Uh, kimchi just uh, loves my gut. Nice. So that's my recipe. So what have you got, Carl? Okay, well, um, a couple episodes back, I did a Bernays sauce. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, talked about classic French sauces. And I'm going to talk about another one today. This is Bordelais. Mm, nice. And Bordelais is so easy. It's essentially, and most sauces are, let's face it. You take mm. some stock, you take some seasonings, maybe a little alcohol, and you reduce it. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> I mean, that's essentially what a yeah. sauce is, right? Pretty much it. And you monte it with a bit of butter, you know. Yeah, you concentrate the flavor by reducing it. So there are a lot of fancy Bordelais sauces out there, Food Network, Wolfgang Puck, if you do a, just a, mm -hmm. a, a Google search. But I found one that gets very close to the classic French Bordelais, which is at frenchfood.about.com. And I'll provide a link too. Nice. So here are the ingredients. Three quarters of a cup of dry red wine, two shallots, finely chopped, quarter of a teaspoon of dried thyme. I use fresh thyme. I like fresh thyme. Mm -hmm a bay yeah, leaf, two cups of beef stock. However, 
You can use veal stock. That's another uh, interpretation. And uh, probably more classic French is is uh, veal stock. But, you know, yeah. beef stock, fine. If you make your own, great. Uh, no problem. Salt and pepper to taste. And um, optionally, you can use a, a bit of butter. Now, mm, butter. it's very easy. You take the red wine, the shallots, the thyme, and the bay leaf and simmer it over medium heat. You bring it to a boil and then reduce it to half its original volume. So you're basically nice. taking stuff that tastes good already and, yep. and making it twice as flavorful. Concentrating it. This is a very typical sta a starter for a French sauce. Absolutely, absolutely. So this recipe says at this point you add the beef stock to the pan and bring the mixture to a boil again. Mm. However, I would say just throw the beef stock in there, the veal stock or whatever, <laughs> and reduce the whole thing down. Yeah. Um, yeah, it does tell you to skim and discard any foam that appears on the top sauce. That essentially comes from the bones, doesn't it? Yeah, the foam. Yeah. 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 And if you were going to make your own stock, what I would do is roast veal bones, cow bones, oh, yeah. beef bones in the oven with olive oil mm. and get them brown and crispy. I mean, yeah, because that may, that Maillard reaction, to, it's basically caramelization. It's just yeah. caramelizing all of the, uh, the sugars in, in, the, in the meat that's, exactly. attached, that's still attached to the bones. And delicious. then I would take those bones and throw them uh, in a, uh, well, first I'd deglaze the pan with a little wine to get the bits off, put all that in a pressure cooker and with some water and just uh, uh, pressurize that and cook it, pressure cook it for at least 45 minutes, maybe an hour or so. Uh, two or three hours, I would. <laughs> well, you'd do it two or three hours, right? Yeah, yeah. And the more you do it, the more you're going to abstract that flavor. But if you're, right. if not, just, you know, you can use bone broth. Sure. Um, so essentially what you're going to do is continue cooking it down until it's thickened enough to coat a spoon. Hmm. And then you run it through a sieve, a fine mesh sieve, to take out all the, the, the bits, right? Yeah. And uh, now you add your salt and pepper to taste. And I would hold off on doing that until you've actually reduced it so that it, yeah. you know, it. Until it you know what it's going to taste like. Yeah. And the coating the spoon trick is what you do. You hold up, yeah. a, if it coats a spoon, it's thick enough. Yeah. So is there a way to stop it from building up a skin? You know how sometimes sauces build up a skin? Is there a way to stop that happening? That's right. And this is a very French technique, but it's very cool. And they talk about it on this website. Is just take some cold butter and just oh, yeah. lightly rub the cold butter across the top of the uh, of the sauce in the pan. On the hot sauce. On the hot sauce yeah. until the whole top is covered in a layer of butter. And so that mm. basically keeps the air out, which is what sort yeah. of crusts up on a sauce. So if you're going to yeah. serve it, nice. you know, if you're going to serve it right then... Just go ahead mm -hmm. and serve it. But if you, what typically we do is we make the sauce ahead of time and then just let yeah. it warm up and, and stay warm on the stovetop so that this will keep it from creating a skin. Nice. Now, of course, you said butter, right? Butter. Butter. So, yeah, if you want to add a little butter to make this more buttery, go right ahead. Who cares? And the French have a term for that called Monty. They mm. monte the sauce by adding butter, and they're basically emulsifying a fat into the the into the into the sauce, and it thickens yep. it, and it it makes it more unctuous, I guess. And heavy cream is also another good one. You can yeah. uh, put in a little heavy cream; doesn't have to be too much. Just bring it to a boil, mm. and then down to a simmer for five or ten minutes, and that will thicken up nicely. Awesome! That sounds delicious. I'm going to have to try that. Yeah, Bordelais. All right. And of course, if you have anything you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute what we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. Yeah. And you can follow us on Twitter at Two Keto Dudes or on Instagram at Two Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join our Facebook community, uh, I think we've currently got about 7,000 people um, in our Facebook group, and you can get to that at fb.2keto, that's the number 2keto.com. Keep calm and keto on. Keep calm and keto on, Carl. All right, and we'll see you next time on, on two, 2 Keto, keto Dudes. Dudes.